Welcome to Digital Ship webinar, where we invite you to discuss should we use high frequency radio mesh networks as a secure backup alternative to SATCOMs? Tony Linden, Chief Product Officer at Tel Telenor Maritime, is connected with us from Finland, and he is our guest speaker today. Use the chance to ask him questions during this webinar that is kindly sponsored by Telenor Maritime. As always, we'll start with Carl Jeffrey, founding editor of Digital Ship, sharing some of his thoughts why mesh networks are relevant for shipping. Oh, okay, so satellite communications isn't the only way we can send data between ships and shore. So there's an alternative we can use mesh networks, such as the one developed by Telenor Maritime. So we're sending much smaller chunks of data via a secure network of high frequency radio stations around the surface of the earth. So just the basics of the technology, an HF radio signal can go up to 10,000 kilometers because waves are directed at an angle into the sky, they refract back to the Earth from the ionosphere, so they can travel around the curve of the Earth. But we're calling it a mesh because with such a long range, 10,000 kilometers, there's lots of different routes the data can take between the ship and its destination. So there's a sort of radio stations around the Earth, they're not 10,000 kilometers apart, and a if one radio station is out of action, the data can still find its way. So you, you wouldn't use this for streaming big data files or telephone calls, but you might want to use it for small operation and critical data packets. So why would shipping companies want to use this? Now, one reason is a backup to satellite communications. Now, I'm on a bit of a dangerous ground here. I don't want to sort of scaremonger and say that satellite communications aren't reliable, but what we have heard is uh, reports about electronic warfare between navies around the world, which might involve one navy trying to disable the GPS and communication system of another one. Now, as we understand it, this is only um, places where navies are actually doing activity. They wouldn't attack commercial shipping, but commercial shipping could get caught up in it. And uh, I heard a speaker on an International Chamber of Shipping webinar, he picked the Eastern Med and around Crimea as parts of the world, this might happen. And uh, our speaker today is also an electronic warfare expert, so we might get more into that. But uh, there's also a, a other benefits. So if you've got sensor systems and automated devices on board, you can. Uh, the normal way to do it would be to use the shipboard PCs and the high bandwidth SATCOM systems and the corporate IT networks, where, or you can send it through this lower bandwidth mesh network and you can draw your own conclusion about which is easier to hack. Now, there's a sort of bit of a con controversial issue is uh, sometimes data what we want to send data directly to equipment suppliers rather than going through the shipping company systems and uh, if that's happening then it could be easier to do it this way than have to deal with uh, going through all the corporate networks it's a bit controversial because shipping companies often say they don't want this but uh, what I think shipping companies really want is they want to control it so they can control it but they don't actually ha have to handle the, the bits themselves now, the, the data is also sent encrypted. This is technology developed for military use. It's not just for security. The encryption also is a way of making sure all the packets that get sent all arrive at the other end because they, they can go in different ways. So that makes it more reliable. But if you wanted to send something with high encryption with a much richer sort of deeper end-to-end -end encryption as a service, this is a service developed for military use, remember, then... Uh, this might be something you, you want to use. So our speaker is Tony Linden, who's the CPO of Telenor Maritime and a former electronic warfare officer in the Finnish Defence Forces. He's based in Ulu, very far north in Finland. We'd like to make this a kind of a discussion session. So, you know, the question of whether this thing is useful or not. So uh, we're very here to hear your views afterwards. You can contribute with uh, the chat box, the Q&A or the raise your hand button, and we might be able to bring you into the discussion personally. So I'd like to invite Tony to give the opening talk. Thank you. Thank you very much, Carl, and uh, uh, very honored to, to be here. I will just uh, pull up my presentation. I guess you can yeah. see it well. Yeah, thank you. Good. So uh, uh, thanks for a very, uh, very nice and informative uh, uh, intro, Carl. Uh, first, a couple of words about Telenor Maritime. So uh, we are Traditionally, probably better known from uh, from cruise and ferry segment, but uh, uh, but now we are uh, moving more into uh, wider scope of the uh, of the maritime uh, maritime business, uh, uh, including also also merchant uh, fisheries and uh, and and different kind of uh, uh, customers uh, in in maritime 
uh, segment. Telenor Maritime is part of Telenor Group that is among one of the world's biggest uh, telcos. Uh, we've been around for 165 years. Uh, we employ more than 20,000 people and uh, the annual revenue is, uh, is a bit, uh, bit more than 10 billion euros. Uh, uh, we are listed in, uh, in uh, uh, Oslo Stock Exchange as the third biggest company uh, in, uh, in Oslo. So uh, with this, uh, I dare to say that we have a good uh, uh, backing uh, as a part of Telenor Group. And uh, uh, our aim is really to, uh, to build uh, the next, uh, next phase of the maritime industry by uh, enabling secure and efficient operations by providing global access to data. So this is basically what we focus on uh, when we talk about the, uh, uh, our customers in the, in the maritime segment. I will start with the, uh, with a short intro uh, about cy uh, cybersecurity uh, situation in the maritime industry and uh, why uh, what is what is going on and why cybersecurity is, is such an issue. And this is a, a little bit of intro towards uh, the technical solution uh, I'm going to introduce uh, to you. And then we're going to uh, deep dive into a couple of use cases of uh, uh, these uh, radio-based mesh networks uh, allows us to, to provide. So we see a huge uh, up, uh, up to, uh, uh, going trend in uh, uh, cyber attacks in, in maritime attacks. To based on Lloyds, there's a 900% increase in maritime uh, OT attacks in the last three years. And uh, when we think about the impact 92% of estimated costs arising from cyber attacks are actually uninsured. So this is uh, not only a technical issue, but, uh, but mainly commercial and operational issue uh, to understand the, the operating environment and, and how the operating environment is, uh, is currently changing. Uh, this big growth in, in maritime cyber attacks has also effect on, uh, on new regulations. Uh, uh, there is a new ISM code uh, for uh, for cyber risk, there's a guideline on risk management, uh, and and then quite recently there's a U.S. Uh, Coast Guard uh, guidance for uh, for taking a real actions to do the inspections on vessels and, and and actually take quite strict measures on on the vessels that doesn't comply with them uh, with the requirements. But there's also growing pressure from uh, from the uh, ship op uh, uh, on ship operators uh, to tackle these uh, these issues. So why uh, cybersecurity is such an issue in maritime? Uh, we have identified four main things here. First of all, the vessels, they traditionally been quite isolated. And now the change we see through the digitalization when uh, systems are going to be connected, uh, that is way fast the change that they were, uh, what the maritime industry has traditionally been, uh, been used to. Uh, and of course, uh, the reason for connecting different, uh, different onboard uh, systems and devices uh, is uh, the uh, the business pressure to make uh, to make shipping uh, to operate more efficiently and and also the environmental pressure that basically follows hand in hand with the uh, with the fuel consumption. The other main uh, main thing is that the, the onboard capabilities uh, on the vessel they are somewhat limited. Uh, the ship's master is uh, legally responsible of uh, of these uh, uh, these issues, but the uh, in practice, uh, there is uh, uh, quite limited capabilities in most of the vessels, uh, how to deal with the, uh, with the IT networks and, uh, and uh, the cybersecurity uh, issues arising. Then uh, when there is this uh, uh, constant pressure for operating more efficiently, operate more uh, on a more green way, it means that the onboard equipment, uh, they need to provide data, they need to provide uh, visibility what's going on, but those equipment, they are not designed to be connected. So there is no uh, uh, sufficient security built in to most of the equipment. And also it is not uh, sustainable to consider that uh, these equipment will be all replaced uh, in order to uh, allow uh, digitalization to move ahead. So this is just uh, just a fact we need to accept that the, uh, in order to use data for uh, more efficient operations, uh, uh, we need to connect the equipment that are not secure by design. And then, uh, then the fourth thing is that uh, uh, 
typically or traditionally there's been only one channel uh, that takes care of all the traffic uh, and, and basically everything is bundled into ship's IT network, meaning crew welfare, uh, operational traffic, but now more and more in the OT systems. And this creates a quite challenging environment when you basically have a crew using uh, uh, the same channel for their uh, own entertainment. Uh, where uh, one should uh, move the navigational data and, uh, and uh, operation critical data. So this is pretty much the uh, uh, the environment and intro uh, why security and, uh, and specifically uh, cyber security has become such an issue in the maritime. Next, I will uh, explain a little bit the, uh, the radio part and how we have solved uh, the alternative way of connecting the vessel. So. Uh, uh, I dare to say that we have reinvented HF radio. Uh, HF radio is known on vessels typically from the SOLAS requirement. There is this uh, uh, HF radio uh, on board that is very seldom used for anything uh, anything meaningful, and it's sticked on the uh, on the uh, SOLAS uh, radio channel. Uh, we thought that the, uh, it would be a good idea to use this uh, pretty much unused uh, part of the spectrum uh, to. Uh, to bring an uh, uh, additional way to send data uh, over the long distances. So, uh, uh, so we basically put everything aside, but was related to, uh, let's say, old-fashioned or legacy HF radio, and started from scratch thinking how a system like this uh, should operate. And uh, uh, as an outcome of that, uh, we, uh, we produced a radio that... Uh, that is fully automatic, uh, so there is no need <clears throat> need for any kind of a radio operator to take care of uh, of uh, any parameters or anything like that. The only user interface on the radio is a power switch you can see on the top left uh, corner. So you, uh, you just switch it on or switch it off. Uh, how the radio works is that it receives the whole HF spectrum all the time, uh, meaning that uh, each and every radio uh, understands what is happening in the spectrum and they understand the, uh, the environment where they are uh, operating. It is capable of operating without any uh, other infrastructure, so it, it's not depend on GPS, uh, any kind of a network synchronization or anything like it is a complete uh, standalone system. It, uh, and that, of course, means also that it's very hard to uh, uh, to interfere the system uh, because uh, uh, it, it doesn't have any kind of a uh, uh, outside requirements uh, to be able to, uh, to communicate. And uh, on, the, uh, on, on the data transmission side, uh, we adapt uh, to existing conditions and what kind of uh, data we have. Uh, currently, we can go up to 153 kilobits per second uh, uh, over the HF radio, uh, radio link. So it's not uh, for web browsing or anything like that, but it's uh, perfectly suitable for business critical data and uh, and keeping uh, keeping operations up and running as well as uh, digitalization and IoT uh, IoT data. So how uh, how does the mesh network work? Is that the, uh, we have a fully global uh, uh, network of vessels uh, uh, out there where uh, each radio has a built-in cellular uh, mobile broadband uh, modem. Whenever the vessels are near coast or at port, uh, uh, she will automatically establish a connection to uh, the cellular network and, uh, and use the cellular network as, as a way to uh, establish a, a, a secure connection to our backend services. And those vessels uh, who already have the, uh, the, the cellular access, they will then operate as a base station or gateway to all the other vessels. Uh, out at the at Blue Sea, and typically the the range uh, of HF radio can be up to ten thousand kilometers. So it's quite easy to understand that uh, each vessel at sea, they all uh, she always has a multiple points of connect uh, around the uh, around the globe. So here you can see the concept of of mesh network, and and also uh, in parallel uh, how it differentiates from SATCOM. So on the on the left hand side picture you will see uh, a snapshot from uh, uh, from uh, from our network where basically there is a vessel in uh, Indian Ocean and uh, uh, the lines you can see there those are the uh, the base stations she can uh, she can hear at the same time 
And, and now if there's a situation that she starts sending data, for example, through the vessel in Singapore, and uh, for whatever reason, uh, the link goes down or, uh, or the network decides to uh, reorganize itself, she can do a handover and uh, keep sending the data, for example, through the vessel uh, in, uh, in Mediterranean area. And this gives a huge robustness to the network uh, because we can very flexible uh, uh, way adjust the network all the time and everything happens uh, automatically. Uh, if there is any kind of a drops in connection, the network automatically will pick up in, uh, in, in no time, and continue the data transmission where it, uh, where it was when something, um, uh, something happened. Uh, it also means that we don't struggle with congestion because the more vessels we add to the network, the more base station and the more uh, kind of a channels to communicate we always, uh, uh, always provide. So unlike the satellite networks, uh, uh, our network just gets better and better when you add more users uh, uh, to, the, uh, to the network and there is no single point of failure because uh, uh, each and every vessel can typically communicate in the range of 10,000 kilometer by utilizing all the other vessels out there. So as a, uh, as a, as a, as a principal uh, drawing, this is how it, uh, uh, how it looks. And we quite often see the situations where there's, for example, a vessel in, uh, in, in the middle of Atlantic that she can send part of the data through the vessel in North, uh, uh, North America, part of the data through the vessel in, in Europe. And uh, what happens then is that uh, we collect all the data from the different sources, we combine it in our backend services, and we provide one comprehensive data package uh, to, uh, to the end, end customer. So the cellular connection as a part of this solution, it, uh, it is always included there and uh, uh, it is integrated to the radio device. So there's only a one, uh, uh, one equipment that needs to be installed uh, on board of the vessel. And we uh, offer this as a managed service, meaning that we also take uh, care of the mobile broadband uh, uh, roaming agreements and, and that data is all, uh, also available to our customers when they are near shore or, uh, or at port. So then uh, jumping uh, to a couple of, uh, uh, couple of use cases that uh, hopefully explains uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the use of this kind of a technology a little bit more in, in details. I have picked up now uh, two use cases here. One to be verified corporate communication channel, meaning this kind of a, a secure, uh, dedicated backup for the vessels and uh, other being secure OT network uh, uh, for, the, uh, for the vessel digitalization. Uh, from technical perspective, uh, uh, the setup uh, is the same and, and it doesn't differ, but the, uh, but the use case and the, uh, and the connections on vessel and, and how they use the data, uh, uh, those are, those are a, little, a little bit different. So if you first look the, the verified corporate communication channel, uh, meaning that the, uh, it is basically an email channel for ship's master uh, to, co uh, to cooperate. Uh, it's meant for resilience and, and business continuity uh, to respond the, uh, and, and recover, uh, recovery channel uh, in case, if, for example, the vessel's IT network goes down for, uh, for, whatever, uh, for uh, whatever reason. And it also pro uh, provides this kind of a point of truth communication uh, to the vessel uh, so uh, it is like an ultimate backup to keep the operations running, no matter what happens to vessels, uh, other connectivity and uh, an IT network. So either on board or uh, or even on uh, on on shore uh, shore side. Uh, the good thing with the solution is that uh, it is actually based on how the ships uh, operate today. So uh, so ships masters they are quite familiar with this kind of technology and uh, and the applications what we are talking here. And, uh, and that, uh, that basically makes the system very easy, uh, easy to start using and, uh, uh, and, and uh, uh, set up. If looking uh, how the setup looks uh, in this case on the, on the vessel, uh, so there's a one radio device uh, that, that is then powered up and uh, there can be a standalone uh, uh, computer with the, uh, with the email uh, for captain and chief engineer uh, office or, uh, or wherever uh, that, is, that is placed. On board of the vessel, uh, sorry, on, uh, on, uh, on deck, there is a uh, broadband HF antenna, uh, cellular antenna for this mobile broadband connectivity. And we also provide a GPS antenna just for, uh, for tracking purposes, but the system doesn't need that. 
uh, in order to be uh, to be op uh, operational. The whole setup can be uh, can be done by crew, and and normally how we operate is that the, uh, we just ship the equipment uh, on board of the vessel, and we give uh, instructions and guidance to the uh, to the uh, to the crew. Crew can do the uh, the full installation, uh, for example, when they are sailing. So there is no need for any uh, any extra time spent uh, at port or anything like that. Uh, and when the system is installed, it automatically calls our 24/7 uh, uh, network operation center, and we will do the remote commissioning of the uh, of the system. So, uh, uh, what uh, what we provide uh, in this use case is uh, the connectivity uh, uh, for basically securing that the operations uh, are always maintained, no matter what happens. Uh, it can be a satellite system failure, it can be a cyber attack, it, it can be uh, uh, what, uh, uh, what, what, whatever, but the, uh, because of the, uh, by the nature of this HF radio uh, connectivity, it is extremely robust and, uh, and, and reliable. So uh, in our normal package, there is a, a, a data allowance for the uh, global data, meaning that uh, you can communicate wherever you want. And then because there is also this uh, Including mobile broadband, we offer also uh, also a high data uh, bandwidth mobile uh, broadband data as a part of the uh, of the setup. And and like I said, uh, all the installation and setup will be uh, typically done by by crew, so there is no any upfront cost, any uh, investment to be made. It's pure uh, subscription based uh, solution. The advantages of this approach uh, compared to uh, uh, maybe adding an, uh, another satellite system on board or, or, or something like that uh, is first of all that it's simple and it's uh, it's easy also for crew to uh, crew to understand. It is a pure, uh, pure subscription model without the uh, upfront investments, and it has a truly uh, global coverage with the military grade uh, uh, grade security. Just as an example, uh, I went through uh, the users of the system and maybe uh, one of the best references uh, when we talk about the global coverage is uh, National Geographic and Lindblad expeditions because uh, they sail as far as you can sail with the vessels, uh, 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 basically, basically all the way to the uh, polar region at the, at the both uh, ends of the globe. And as you can see here, uh, they've been quite satisfied with them. Uh, with the system and, and they actually use it as their primary communication when they are at the uh, at the high uh, high arctic uh, uh, areas and so so forth then if we uh, if we talk about the sec uh, the second use case uh, the secure ot networks uh, uh, this is where the setup is a little bit more complicated when we integrate into uh, onboard machinery but uh, but i will uh, i will try to explain this on a, uh, on a simple matter because uh, in practice it is a, it is a very simple uh, simple system and, uh, and, and easy to, uh, to set up. The main challenge uh, uh, currently when, uh, when we talk about the digitalization and connecting OT, uh, OT systems is it's that it is a pretty challenging uh, environment. So this is uh, like a normal way uh, how uh, uh, ship owner operators uh, they communicate. There's a satellite link with a firewall uh, taking data to the ship owner. Some of the uh, uh, companies that, uh, that's been taking the first steps on, uh, in the field of digitalization, they also have some of the uh, equipment manufacturers uh, allowed to use the same, uh, same channel uh, through their own firewalls and so on. And it's still uh, uh, working pretty okay. Some of the, uh, the more advanced companies, they may use a third party service providers for ERP systems or uh, energy optimization or something like that. And even in this case, uh, uh, it is still manageable. But uh, if you're thinking about uh, taking the full advantage of using data for uh, uh, decision making in, in business and sharing data with different, uh, different stakeholders, uh, things becomes a little bit more complicated when you start adding uh, more players uh, operating on the same uh, same vessel. And eventually, of course, uh, there is these challenges uh, when the data is clustered, uh, uh, who can share the data, uh, how you share the data with third parties and, and so on. And, uh, and also this would require uh, even way more complex uh, IT network setups on board of the vessel with the multiple firewalls and uh, and 
uh, kind of the overall uh, environment becomes extremely challenging to, uh, uh, to use and, and manage. And then there's these fundamental questions uh, when the data is, uh, is clustered and siloed, uh, who owns the data and who controls the use of data. So uh, we, have, uh, we have built a model to simplify that uh, by basically uh, uh, streamlining the data, uh, uh, data stream back and forth of the vessel, uh, meaning that the, uh, the ship owner has full control of use of the data. We offer this end-to-end uh, -end, uh, digitalization as a, uh, as a managed service. And then uh, based on the allowance of ship owner, we can open, uh, open the access to different OEM service providers so that they can access data instantly and on request. So there's no more demand for us asking for connectivity or, uh, or changing setups or opening ports so, uh, and, and, and so, so on. So how this is done in practice, uh, uh, when we talk about connecting the OT networks, uh, first of all, uh, on the left-hand side, you can see the existing IT networks that we leave as it is. Uh, so this is uh, one of the learnings uh, Telenor has uh, through also digitalizing the other industries over the past decade or so, that in most cases, the OT uh, systems, uh, they actually use uh, dedicated channels, just like you think, for example, the electricity meters at home. Uh, most homes, they have a, a Wi-Fi or some kind of a, a broadband available. But typically, uh, the power line companies, they actually bring uh, the electricity meters with the built-in connectivity because it's just so much easier to manage and, uh, and, and operate that way. The similar approach and, and learning we, uh, we have taken from the other indust industries and, and we're bringing to maritime, uh, that there is a dedicated channel uh, that doesn't uh, uh, interfere with the, uh, with the IT networks, uh, but uh, provides this kind of secure, uh, uh, dedicated access to, uh, uh, to data. Going a little bit more in details and explaining the building blocks here. So uh, uh, on board the vessel, there's a different, uh, different legacy systems. And, and like you uh, hopefully remember from the, uh, from the first slides, these systems traditionally doesn't provide a uh, built-in or, or secure by design approach. So we need to also consider that the, uh, the two-way communication we, uh, we provide to these systems, it needs to be secure and, uh, and, and built on, on a proper way. So the first building block in this uh, uh, solution when we talk about the, uh, OT, connecting OT systems is the data collection meaning that we have a, a DNV approved a data collection unit that can uh, integrate with one, whatever machinery there is on board of the vessel. We can uh, integrate with navigation, boilers, uh, propulsion, automation system whatsoever. Uh, and uh, what, what we do with the data collection is that uh, we collect the data and we structure the data from multiple sources so that the uh, vessel basically has one uh, like a official database uh, one example of, uh, of the workflow is, uh, for example, uh, uh, let's, let's say speed through water. So you will get speed through water information from a multiple sources on, uh, on board of the vessel. What we do in the data collection is that we build the database uh, following the, uh, uh, the maritime ISO format for the database, uh, meaning that the, uh, in our data collection, when we have built the database, there is a one like a, a, a valid, uh, validated uh, value for speed through water, for example, that, uh, that the different stakeholders can then use. Uh, we are able to process the data, do a lot of uh, prioritizing, uh, pre-processing, formatting the IoT, uh, IoT data on board of the vessel. And we also have an environment to, uh, to run third-party applications as a, uh, as a sandbox step uh, solution uh, in, in our uh, hardware, meaning that uh, there is no need for additional uh, third-party uh, uh, servers and stuff like that to be uh, to be brought on board, and then we make the data available. So we utilize this global dedicated uh, uh, network for uh, uh, for connecting uh, business critical data, uh, meaning that the data is available uh, uh, on shore side in, uh, in in real time, no matter where the vessel is sailing. And then there's a control element, meaning that we basically replicate the same data structure that you have on board of the uh, uh, vessel again, following the ISO format. Uh, and then uh, we control the, uh, the use of the data so that the, uh, the data or any subset of the data can be shared with different uh, third-party uh, 
uh, uh, stakeholders like data analysis companies, uh, application providers, uh, authorities, uh, uh, regulators, uh, uh, class society, customers, uh, and, and so on. And then, uh, of course, the full, full set of data is always available for, uh, for a ship owner uh, for their uh, internal use. This is one example of this kind of a uh, global real-time data. Uh, here you can see uh, the vessel uh, sailing across uh, Pacific, uh, coming from US to Asia. Uh, the part of uh, land you see over there is uh, uh, it's uh, Japan, and uh, then on the on the left uh, it is Ch uh, China coast uh, coastal area there. So. Uh, there's been some incident, as you can uh, see, and this is a real data from a real vessel uh, utilizing this kind of a, a connectivity. So you see that the, uh, for some reason, the vessel has stopped there uh, in, in Pacific. And uh, if we uh, jump to the vessel and we take a look at the data, we see that the, uh, uh, okay, so torsion angle has changed. Uh, there's a change in shaft speed, uh, uh, the fuel density, uh, we can see the, uh, the the mass flow from the fuel flow uh, uh, meters. What has happened? We can see the engine temperatures uh, from the automation system, and and we can actually see uh, like uh, uh, ninety eight different data points around the vessel. But I just picked up uh, uh, some of those, and then uh, uh, all this data is uh, is available real time uh, at the uh, at the at the office. Uh, and if you need to zoom in, uh, in this case. Uh, 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 for example, for temperature, the interval for engine temperature is uh, is uh, five minutes, but you can um, uh, there's basically no limitation for that. But you can see the quality of data, uh, so there's no caps in data. It is very reliable and uh, uh, and it is real time. And by this, uh, uh, you can have a full visibility on uh, on what's what's happening on the vessel, and and keeping in mind that all this happens without any kind of a. Uh, uh, integration or, uh, or or interference with the ship IT network on a complete standalone network uh, utilizing this uh, HF radio connectivity to give you a full uh, situational picture of what is happening on the on the vessel. Uh, also in this case uh, we offer uh, uh, of the digitalization services as a turnkey service meaning that it is a fully managed service. There is no capex, there is no uh, upfront investments. Uh, but just one subscription that covers uh, the services and depending on uh, the complexity of the vessel and, uh, and the number of signals, uh, uh, the price is starting from around 200 and, uh, 250 euros per month. Uh, but of course we can scale as big as you, as, as you want to go. But the important message is that the, uh, uh, when uh, you start seeing the value out of data and, and scaling up the, uh, the different uh, uh, use cases, uh, the price uh, never skyrockets, but the, uh, uh, but the, uh, kind of the price point you see here, uh, it is uh, uh, it is uh, kind of at the level you should expect. Uh, so, uh, what differentiates us from uh, many other solutions out there that the, uh, uh, we are able to take this uh, telco approach uh, uh, with the heritage of uh, Telenor uh, as a, as a global telco. And our idea is that we bring the infrastructure we build, uh, we build the use cases together with our customers, and uh, by proving the value uh, uh, to our customer uh, of making data available in, in a secure and reliable way, uh, it is the advantage of, uh, of all parties. And, uh, uh, and our experience is that the, uh, using data for decision making in, in maritime is still uh, relatively new. So therefore also we need to consider new kind of a business models and, and the idea where, for example, the shipping company is required to do tens of thousands or even more than 100,000 euros investments for uh, getting the sensor data and all that. It's just not uh, a, a modern way of, uh, of operating in, uh, in kind of a di uh, digital era. As a last thing, uh, just summarizing some of the benefits of this uh, of this approach uh, when we talk about using uh, uh, dedicated networks uh, for uh, for uh, OT data. First of all, uh, it is extremely cost efficient because there is no high up uh, airtime cost. There's no installation cost, even in case of uh, of this uh, uh, connecting OT systems. The crew will actually uh, do the installation, and there's no need for uh, for any. Uh, uh, service technic uh, technicians to uh, to fly in and out or anything like that. 
uh, but we really operate on an extremely cost efficient uh, uh, way. The setup time is uh, it's minimum and, uh, and, and the installation can also be done while the vessel is sailing, so it doesn't uh, require any extra, uh, extra time at, the, uh, at port. Uh, the system is modular and we follow the, uh, the, op uh, the open standards. So uh, basically meaning that if you don't like us, uh, you can get someone else. Uh, but we are quite confident that, the, uh, that, we are, uh, that we are providing a service and, and, and uh, that, that kind of user experience that our customers are extremely satisfied with. And uh, we have an ISO 27001 cyber, uh, cybersecurity certificate, meaning that uh, you can also rely that the, the data is, uh, is handled properly and, uh, and uh, the setup uh, uh, we will uh, put together, uh, together with you is, uh, is uh, top notch when we talk about uh, the security and, uh, and, uh, and, and reliability. So I will, uh, I will stop my presentation here. Uh, I hope that uh, this gave uh, Get, uh, a bit, a bit of a uh, insight and, and uh, uh, idea uh, how to use uh, these kind of uh, software radio-based mesh networks for different use cases and and what is the uh, technical approach uh, behind that. And hopefully, we have a lot of lot of questions and, and, and a good conversation. So over to you, Carl. Wow, thank you very much. Yeah, that's very interesting. So as I said before, if anybody's interested in joining the, the discussion on, on the video, um, if you want to press the raise your hand button, we can see and try and try and bring you in. We, we've got um, four, four questions already. Maybe we'll start with the last one, because I think Frederick is from a shipping company. I don't know if you know each other, but Frederick, Frederick Hoftgen is the IT security architect with Ecro Lines in Finland. So he's asking about how it would compare to Iridium. So Iridium also goes over the Arctic and gives an alternative means and uh, it's quite secure. Is that something? You're... Yeah. Uh, so, uh, yeah, abs ab absolutely. Very good. Very good question. Uh, uh, so, uh, of course, uh, the, the main difference is that, uh, uh, first of all, from the price point, uh, uh, I dare to say that we are uh, uh, quite much more more affordable because there is no uh, equipment investment and also the airtime cost is uh, uh, is is uh, uh, lower. But but also then when we think about these kind of uh, extreme use cases where, uh, for example, the the data has a high uh, uh, reliability requirements uh, in our system, we always make sure that the data is uh, received correctly. So there is a two-way uh, uh, acknowledgement in the system. And for example, if there is a part of data missing, uh, uh, the system will automatically ask that again uh, from the vessel. So to give you an idea about the reliability of the system, uh, the last time we have lost a single customer data package, that was uh, uh, 22 months ago, which uh, I think uh, is, is quite an achievement for any communication system. So, uh, uh, so, so th those are those are probably the main differentiators, and also when uh, when we talk about the, uh, especially this uh, this kind of a uh, let's say electronic warfare and uh, and, and maybe uh, some uh, spoofing issues and, and these kind of things, uh, uh, when there is a different technology than satellite technology uh, used. Uh, uh, as, as a complementary solution, uh, it means that the, uh, it's so much harder to basically uh, interfere and affect on on vessel operations. Oh, wow, that's great. So we have a uh, Gregor's Pardica, who's uh, in a uh, Gdynia with a uh, lead engineer with Satmar. So it's got two two questions. One about the uh, sensitivity of the HF link to weather conditions like humidity, snow, rain, sun fade, and also. How do you make sure the correct recipient gets the message and only him? Yeah. So uh, if if we start with the uh, uh, with the HF link uh, sensitivity to, to the weather uh, conditions, so basically there is no uh, su such a such an issue uh, because uh, uh, how radio frequencies operate is that the lower frequency you have, uh, the the less uh, it it has impacted on uh, basically any any kind of a. Any, anything happening around so the only uh, the only thing uh, uh, basically uh, affecting is is the solars uh, uh, or the sunspots and the uh, and the space weather but there again uh, with this mesh network approach and having a multiple kind of access points always available on the different directions we uh, we have managed to uh, also also tackle uh, tackle that issue so we don't uh, have similar issues with the uh, uh, with the uh, 
uh, bad weather, for example, or uh, or or tough sea, like uh, like you see with the satellite uh, satellite link. And then when, when we talk about the transmission security, so all the data in our system is uh, it is AAS two fifty six uh, encrypted, uh, and, uh, and and basically uh, it means that the uh, that the system has the addresses uh, where the data is going to. And only when you have the full data package uh, received correctly at the uh, at the uh, uh, right receiver, uh, the data will uh, will will open up. Wow, very good. So we're going to try and bring Lennart Sederberg into the discussion. Lennart is an entrepreneur, marine meteorologist, and consultant with Norcare in Norrköping. I think that's uh, Sweden. Do you want to give you a question, Lennart? Thank you, Carl. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, yes. Very, very good. Uh, a, a very interesting talk, this, and this was a little bit different than I expected, actually, because I, I expected it to be a kind of alternative, a kind of a backup system if the regular thing goes down. But now I understand that this actually, as you presented it, could be instead of for many uh, shipping companies. So my basic question is actually what to, to connect all these different sensors from fuel meters and torque meters and all the stuff, that is normally not so super simple to do. But as you described here, it is a kind of plug-in stuff to, to be sent to the ship and they will basically plug in and it will work. Is that is that really? That sounds magic to me. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Leonard, for uh, for a very uh, very good question. Uh, uh, yeah, we have uh, we have actually put a lot of attention on. Uh, on uh, building a framework uh, that adapts easily to the diff uh, different systems, and uh, and when we offer this as a uh, as a service, it means that the, uh, if there is a system that we don't know from the past, uh, uh, we will do the integration to, uh, typically directly with the uh, with with the system provider. So we uh, we work with the uh, with all the major OEMs and uh, in, in the in the industry. And uh, we have an environment where we can test everything, uh, uh, everything uh, first on land. Uh, to give you an idea, that the, uh, we just recently connected a, a new vessel with the uh, with the bridge and automation system that the, uh, we were not familiar before. Uh, an integration of both of those systems uh, uh, it took less than a day from uh, from our engineers to uh, to complete when we get the data description from the uh, manufacturer. Then we tested everything uh, on our on our uh, test network, and that was actually then the point when we connected back to ship owners, saying that okay, so now we have everything tested, validated, uh, it's pre-configured uh, to your vessel. Please give us an address where we ship the uh, uh, ship the device. They uh, they will uh, they gave us an address where the agent took the uh, the device on board of the vessel. We gave the instructions to crew. That please connect this connector uh, to that port and that uh, this connector to that port, and then we did all the commissioning uh, and, and uh, uh, testing on a live environment uh, remotely, and again plugging into a bridge and a, a navigation system on uh, on that vessel uh, from crew that took less than two hours. Wow. Impressive. And and uh, do I take you right that you, you said about the prices there, no capital costs. So the kind of 340 euro plus 250 euro, that's basically it for having this kind of uh, data transmission. Yeah, ex exactly. And, and in that case, you can actually use the same uh, 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 net network, both for uh, uh, as, as a ultimate backup for guaranteed business continuity and uh, and connecting the uh, the uh, OT systems and sensors uh, on board the vessel. Interesting. With all that. Interesting. Thank you. I think I will call you directly after. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> please do. <laughs> Very good. So we've got uh, two two questions going more into the price and the bandwidth. Um, so Martin Reason is from NSSL and Jorgen Strandberg is from so we had a chat beforehand where you were saying that maybe the communication speed isn't so important that SATCOM people are used to thinking about bandwidth, but uh, here it's more about getting the data through. So maybe do you want to give the... Yeah, so uh, uh, so uh, uh, when, when we talk about the, the data rate, the, high, uh, the highest we can go uh, over HF is currently 153 kilobits per second. Uh, so uh, it, is, uh, it is perfectly suitable for this kind of... a. Uh, uh, IoT uh, digitalization use cases, but also for uh, for sending all, all kind of a, 
uh, official emails and reports and, and and stuff like that what it's uh, what our system is not for it is not for crew welfare it's not for entertainment so we have a clear focus on uh, on on business uh, business data and uh, when we talk about this uh, 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 connecting ot systems what we also do when we build the database on board of the uh, the vessel we can prioritize the different data so the data that has a, a real time requirement we will send directly. That can be, for example, the information if the vessel is operating correctly, and uh, and you will get uh, maybe uh, uh, every minute or uh, or every couple of minutes resolution on data. And then uh, because we also have the included uh, uh, mobile broadband for our cellular connectivity, whenever the vessel is near coast, uh, we can, for example, offload all the data, including the raw data that can be gigabytes of data uh, uh, through the system. So uh, it is built. Kind of a hybrid solution in in that way, and and the idea is that the, uh, we take care of the kind of end to end approach on, uh, on on providing the service and and also optimizing the data if needed. Well, very good. So Frank Dimp, I think he's a lecturer at the University of Ljubljana, Slovenia, in maritime trans studies and transport. So he's he's asking about uh, the iron ionosphere. It's pretty weak, close to the poles. So can you is this all work near to the poles? How far are the HF stations close to the poles? <laughs> yeah, uh, very, very good question again. So, uh, uh, of course, the, the closer we are equatorial, uh, uh, the kind of the uh, the traditionally the better uh, the HF propagation uh, is. Uh, this is one of the advantages of uh, of this cognitive radio, where basically each and every radio they understand the propagation, they understand the network around, and they. Uh, Basically, every second they adapt uh, to the existing uh, situation. So, um, uh, so we haven't faced any issues with the uh, uh, with the vessels operating uh, on on the polar regions, like you saw the uh, uh, the reference from uh, National Geographic, for example, uh, uh, that that sails on on a very extreme uh, lo uh, locations. So, uh, uh, normally, when the vessels are uh, up in a polar region, uh, they communicate uh, uh, within the range of uh, uh, three, four, five thousand kilometers, uh, something like that. But if you start measuring it uh, actually from North Pole and you, and you take uh, even three thousand kilometers down, uh, you have al already quite uh, quite a number of vessels and 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 uh, uh, that meaning in our case also base stations uh, always available. Wow. Oh, so Steve Howard is a uh... With uh, he's a GMGSS consultant in Greater Plymouth area, so he's also a former electronic warfare expert, and uh, so he's asking if if you can uh, jam the HF radio. So. Yeah, so uh, I I need to place my wording uh, words a little bit carefully here, uh, uh, so just because of uh, because of uh, Steve uh, uh, Steve's in my background, uh, but but. Uh, 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 Basically, the only way how you can uh, how you can jam the system is to bring a broadband jammer on board of the vessel. Otherwise, uh, the uh, kind of the spectrum what we use and and what uh, 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 how also the frequency uh, regulations allows us to use the frequencies. It is so wide uh, that it's not feasible to uh, to jam that. And and also because the network reconfigures basically uh, uh, basically every second. It means that if there is a jammer, for example, coming on the uh, exact frequency where we're sending data, it means that the, uh, uh, in less than a second, uh, we have adapted uh, to that situation again. And basically, the one trying to take, take down the system, uh, they need to start the whole procedure again and again. So uh, I dare to say that uh, there is not even a single government uh, who can actually take this system down. Wow, that's great. And uh, Gulzab, that's a lot of questions. I don't know if we can uh, turn your microphone on and you can maybe give, it, give them yourself. Can you? Would, is that a... Is that a... Is it, Vida, can you turn Gulzab's microphone on? I don't know if he's able to, but uh, um, maybe I'll start. Oh, there we go. You're on mute at the moment, I think. Yes, can you oh, hear me? Yes, yes, very good. Yes. Yeah, so I'm you're on. you're from uh, Kongsberg, on your LinkedIn page, technical lead. Yeah. I'm uh, I'm from Kongsberg Maritime, and I have a couple of questions uh, regarding uh, the communication part. Actually, I'm a, I'm a lead uh, in connectivity systems, or I have more experience around connect communication related stuff. So I had a hypothetical question. Firstly, uh, that something like uh, you rely on 
basically uh, uh, on the hops of this high, high frequency communication link hops. And then eventually I think you need one ship that should be near shore to get onto your traffic to the cellular network eventually. Is that right? Yes. Uh, so uh, theoretically, that is exactly how, uh, like you said, that if all the vessels are at Blue Sea, then we don't have a, a, a base station uh, available. But uh, for us, fortunately, that is a, a theoretical uh, situation. So we already have such a, uh, such a wide user base that, uh, that uh, we always see uh, a big number of vessels uh, near, port, uh, near coast or at port. And I'm thinking about the, the normal operating profile, roughly 60% of the time, the merchant vessels, they spend within the, uh, the connectivity range of a mobile broadband. So it actually means that the, uh, uh, if we have 10 vessels, uh, six of those uh, uh, are typically operating as a base station, while four of them uh, are at, the, uh, at, at Blue Sea at the... Uh, at the time, so uh, your some your assumption or question uh, from theoretical uh, perspective uh, is absolutely correct. Uh, but we have uh, uh, already exceeded the critical uh, mass of users for uh, for this to provide a, a really uh, reliable global uh, global coverage uh, all the time. I have some other questions as well. I don't know if if I may uh, yes, or yes, if I have the time. Yeah. Uh, then also, uh, I mean, uh, considering these multiple hops from uh, HF links, uh, considering again hypothetically in opposite direction, so you may end up with multiple duplicated data packets or uh, information arriving at your end systems with very multiple delays. How do you deal with that? Yeah. So uh, uh, first of all, it's 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 good to. Uh, 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 to, to mention that the, uh, we don't offer this kind of a end-to-end -end open TCP IP tunnel. And this is also uh, uh, for, for the security purposes, because if we would do that, then we would open up the system for basically all the threats and malware of the wild internet. So uh, we operate a little bit differently that, uh, because uh, we terminate uh, the traffic at both ends and, uh, and only from kind of a, from, uh, from the point where, uh, where the traffic leaves our system towards uh, uh, any thir uh, third party system, uh, we use uh, like a standard uh, protocols. So we use this kind of a proxy, uh, proxy approach uh, and uh, uh, to keep the applications both uh, on board of the vessel and on, on shore, side, uh, shore side happy. And when we talk about the IoT, uh, IoT use cases, uh, normally we operate with the, uh, with the APIs that use uh, this kind of HTTPS uh, REST's uh, uh, API, uh, API to read and write, uh, write data to the system. But then what happens uh, in the system, uh, uh, we have a mechanisms that uh, if we, for example, collect, uh, uh, get the data uh, like a duplicated or, uh, or so, uh, the data structure then uh, checks the validity of the data. And, uh, and, and also <clears throat> the, uh, the encryption will only open uh, when the package is uh, correctly received. Okay, uh, and then uh, one one last question. Uh, not bothering you more. Uh, you you mentioned that uh, you don't really need GPS related data, but then how you get the location related information? Do you do some kind of uh, high frequency co-location kind of thing, or or what do you actually do there? No, uh, yeah, so uh, so we don't need the GPS data for uh, for the uh, for the communication uh, part to be uh, to be kind of operational but uh, but then of course uh, if you want to record the, uh, the, the vessel location uh, we have a built-in uh, uh, positioning system in the radio so we use a gps uh, uh, galileo baido clonas uh, and a couple of other systems in uh, in par and uh, uh, if you want to get kind of the, uh, the exact location of the radio, uh, then you need to connect the antenna. But the, the communication part doesn't require that. And we can also get the data then from the ship's uh, sensors uh, if that is preferred. Wow, that's fasc fascinating. Yeah. Um, I, I've got a few, few more questions. We've got about five minutes left. But um, just in terms of this radio network, where, where did it come from and who, who owns it? I've noticed you've got terminals in Angola and Cameroon, I think, on the map there. Is that all? Telenor that put all that there? Oh, uh, uh, it is it is a fully mesh uh, mesh network. So uh, it is uh, set up by basically our customers, the users of the system. Uh, so we don't have this kind of a land based infrastructure. Uh, it fully relies on uh, on kind of a, uh, having enough uh, vessels 
uh, where always then uh, a certain amount of vessels are within the, uh, the mobile broadband uh, range. And this is also uh, one part that allows us to offer this service on the, uh, on the very attractive pricing, because we don't have this huge infrastructure cost, what you see with the other systems. So the vessels themselves, oh, I see. So but they can't read each other's data because it's all encrypted. But uh, yeah, so, yeah. So, so when you sign up, you're also agreeing your ship can be a base station with this. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and, and of course, the data uh, that goes through the vessel uh, when she's operating as a base station, uh, uh, that is something uh, that the, uh, we, we cover, the, uh, cover the cost of that use and, and therefore also, uh, all, the, all the installation, they come with the integrated mobile broadband uh, because we also use that for, uh, for landing the data. Wow, that's great. And another thing I was thinking about in terms of a business case, I was thinking of insurance, you know, these devices that truck drivers have, where I think insurance companies, or maybe it's car drivers, where the insurer will say, if I can monitor your data, and I can see you're, you're a better driver, you're not breaking that hard, I can give you a, a lower insurance quote. So we could see something like that in shipping. But in that case, the insurance company would want the data directly, the, you know, with, with agreement with the ship owner, they wouldn't want a ship owner to have a, ch a chance to sort of fiddle the data before giving it to the insurer. I don't know. Maybe yeah. you thought about all these kind of things. Yeah, so so this is actually something uh, where uh, we are one of the few companies that uh, that follow the open standards uh, of a, uh, of a maritime uh, data format. So there is this uh, uh, ISO uh, uh, definition of uh, of vessel databases. Uh, why it's important uh, is, of course, uh, for the data in the integrity, but also because of uh, how you use the different applications and, and how you share the data, meaning that uh, if you as a ship owner have this kind of a structured database that follows the standard, and, and uh, let's say a customer of ours, they want to exp uh, explore, for example, uh, different energy optimization uh, solutions. They can just ask us to open up an API uh, for the same set of data for uh, multiple companies. The companies will have the same uh, data uh, that they actually read uh, onshore database. So there's no need to do absolutely uh, any kind of a changes on vessel because the data is all already available there. Then they can trial, for example, these five different uh, different application uh, in parallel that uses the same data, and then they uh, choose that okay, so we're going to use that uh, that vendor for, uh, for example, for energy optimization. We can close down four APIs, and we uh, we will leave that one open that provides only the data that company needs to provide the services uh, to, uh, to the ship owner. And then if ship owner wants to change uh, uh, that uh, uh, that application. Uh, uh, they can just basically uh, uh, ask us to close the close an API and open another API to another uh, other company. Uh, so uh, uh, when we have actually done this kind of a, uh, uh, harmonizing the data, breaking the data silos, it means that, the, uh, the, that there's very little uh, need to do any kind of a changes on board of the vessel when you uh, when you want to use the data. Uh, and this is actually the advantage of uh, of all the companies because. Uh, it also makes it easier for uh, for service providers and software companies to provide their services, uh, and it lowers their cost because they don't need to travel the vessel, they don't need to think about the installation, they don't need to think where they get data. Uh, we make the data available on a standardized for, uh, form, and they uh, everyone can basically uh, focus on their core business. Well, very good. Well, we've got two minutes left, but maybe we can just make one minute for this question from Martin from Alphatron. He's asking about regulations like using HF transmitters inside port, I think, because you're using solar frequencies. Is that how you get around that? Is that a... Yeah. So, uh, uh, so uh, there, basically, we don't differ from, uh, from a solar, uh, uh, solar equipment. Uh, we, uh, we use the, uh, the IMO uh, frequencies other than uh, emergency frequencies uh, for this kind of a data. And, uh, and, and then if there is a need uh, at some ports to close down the HF transmission, uh, then, uh, then the master uh, uh, can do that from, uh, 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 from our system directly. It means that the, uh, it still leaves the mobile broadband available. Uh, and, uh, and then immediately when the vessel is, uh, is, is basically depart from the, uh, from the uh, harp, uh, port and can switch the HF on again, uh, then she will still operate as a base station uh, uh, as long as they have a mobile broadband connectivity. 
Oh, that's very good. Yes, this is coming from John Charles Cornelou. I just looked up John Charles on LinkedIn. He's from the French Maritime Administration. So that's a, <laughs> he's asking for your email contact. So we'll, well, that's fantastic. Well, that's very interesting, very eye opening. And I shall pass back to Vida for the closing words. Thank you. So it was our webinar, the last one in May, where you heard Tony Linden, Chief Product Officer of Telenor Maritime, sharing his expertise about high frequency mesh networks. We'll actually host a couple more webinars with Telenor, so keep an eye on our broadcast schedule and an update about next month. In June, we are running a series of webinars on cybersecurity and some great stories on vessel performance. You may, you may sign up in advance at webinars.digitalship.com. Now, Digital Ship is signing off. Take care. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.